Software innovations are essential to keeping up with the pace of the internet age. With that in mind, a 2010 young global leader, this is my co-YGL, is setting the trend in cloud computing. Now, many of you may be asking, what is that? Here's a look. Some providers like Morph Labs serves as an active cloud enabler. From Cebu, Morph Labs moved its operations to the U.S. and also opened operations in Japan and Australia. Such trends put the company and its innovator at the forefront of the industry. Last year, from a pool of almost 5,000 candidates, Winston Damarillo Morph Labs Incorporated CEO and Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Global Gateway Innovation Exchange was among three Filipinos named Young Global Leaders by the World Economic Forum. Today, he continues to evolve the company as well as technology and software solutions. Now joining us for today's hot copy, the CEO of Morph Labs and Global Gateway Innovation Exchange, young global leader Winston Damarillo. Good day to you, Winston. Hi, Karen. I'm so Good happy morning. you came. All right. Now tell us exactly what cloud computing is about and where do we stand in the Philippines when it comes to this? So cloud computing, Karen, is just a model of consuming computing resources okay. uh, from, from the cloud. And the reason why we call it the cloud is it means you don't necessarily need to know where it's coming from. Okay. Right? You're only going to get very good information as to what you're going to get from it. Okay. And cloud computing basically democratizes computing. It allows people that don't have access to computers or data centers to be able to put their content or the application on the web so people can consume it. And the way it's put on the web is in a manner where you only pay for what you need, just like electricity or power, okay. right? Okay. So with cloud computing, people can start in as little as one or half or even a quarter server that they rent per hour. But if their business is successful or their projects are successful, they have the opportunity to scale that as big as they need it to be. Okay. And then when you're done consuming it, they can shrink it down as small as they need it to be. So it's a most efficient way of consuming computing. And okay. It, now, can, can you now when when you say computing, do you put up a database? Is this a physical facility? So cloud computing, there is actually a physical resource behind cloud okay. computing, right? These are servers that have been built so it's got the most efficiency in power. It's the most efficiency in compression in space. Okay. And it's got the latest uh, computing um, building blocks okay. to it. Now, where it becomes, it's made available to the consumer is through software and the internet. Now, how does this affect the ordinary Filipino? Give me an example. When it comes to Alimbawa, corriente, electricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, where it impacts the most the Filipinos is in our ability to become global entrepreneurs. Okay. Cloud computing are computing resources that live around okay. the world. And it's computing resources that, at, uh, let's say, a simple web, uh, an oh, entrepreneur wow. finds an idea okay. uh, that can be delivered over the web. In the past, before cloud computing, that entrepreneur would need to have to buy its own computers, would need to look for a data center and internet connection, and then go to business. And when he goes to business, he's limited by the size of the computer he can afford, right? Okay. With cloud computing, that what entrepreneur does, what does can just go and log on to any of the public cloud providers like Amazon or Rackspace, and they could just rent the capacity they need. They can start exploring in their ideas, and those ideas that they explore are immediately available worldwide to worldwide consumers. Okay, now is the Filipino ready for this? We're not, we're not. Our infrastructure, our digital infrastructure in the Philippines needs a lot of work. Okay. You know, I think there's a lot of talk about what we know to be our, as our dominant digital infrastructure, which is mobile phones and texting, right? For us to participate in the global market, our broadband infrastructure in the Philippines needs to become stronger. Our ability to connect that broadband infrastructure to the rest of the world needs to become stronger, bigger, and fatter. Okay. And our computing infrastructure in the Philippines is severely lacking. I, I, you know, just, just asking around all the big companies in the Philippines, there seems to be a lack of a carrier neutral data center here in the Philippines. Okay. We still need to build that. And you want to build that? Well, along with a few you know, Filipino entrepreneurs, okay. right? And we're so proud about Global Gateway and Morph. It's Filipino funded. You know, uh -oh. we're built using a fund called Global Gateway, was predominantly owned by Filipinos, okay. and we've been building companies along those lines. Now, I want, I want people to understand exactly what you do. You're quite young. Right now, you're only 41. But how did you become this successful? I mean, you're successful in Silicon Valley. And you, you, did you come from something like Harvard or whatever? No, actually, I, a I, better school. I always tell people that you know, all I needed to do to be successful in Silicon Valley is a Lasallian education. Oh, I <laughs> And so it, okay. works, it right. works very well for me. I competed with people that are from Stanford or from MIT uh -oh. or from 
you know, from the biggest schools at Caltech, right, in the U.S., when I applied at Intel. Okay, you right? applied at Intel. So okay, my that first was job first job. My first job and my only job that made a significant impact on my life is the work I did at Intel. Okay. I was there for eight years. I started with the labs, and I ended up with venture capital for Intel Corporation. But getting to Intel, right, the only educational background I had was from LaSalle. From LaSalle. And uh, I think the other thing I can attribute to that is learning how to fail early. That helped me quite a bit. Uh -uh. And I learned it very early in my okay. life. So you'd be like a nerd when you were young. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a very persistent nerd. Yes, when I was yes, yes. Well, now nerds young. are so cool. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> such a nerd now. No, yeah. because I want to ask you, after Intel, did you form your first company? Yeah, Intel was uh, a great place for me to explore. There's two jobs that I did okay. at Intel that were significant, right? The first thing was uh, I worked at Intel Architecture Labs, which determined the businesses Intel would want to get to and win in the next five to ten years, so forward-looking. Yeah. Then the tool that I had to have Intel participate in that business opportunity was venture capital okay. and corporate venture capital. So I got to build companies inside Intel for Intel. Okay. And that was a great training ground for me. To build Spirit. companies. To build companies. Uh -huh. So in other words, what's unique about you is that not only are you a major techie, but you're a techie entrepreneur in the U.S. Yes, yes. And from La Salle. From La Salle. I wanna, I wanna add to, it's so 100 you, year yeah. anniversary of La Salle. So I want to plug with, uh, my oh. school and my colleagues from there. No, but that's, that's very difficult to be an entrepreneur, more so be an entrepreneur in the United States. Mm -hmm. And how did you, your first company that you built was Glucode? Yes, yes. Blue code. But let me step back a little okay. bit. I remember in Harvard when we were there, we talked about a crucible, right? This yeah. is the thing that defines your life going forward. Yeah. You know, well, I, yeah. and this is from my early childhood. You know, I was, you know, I, I, people don't know this, but I was born wealthy, you know, okay. with my parents, and we lost all that weight. You lost? All that wealth. We, we well, lost, lost that. You lost all the wealth. All the wealth we uh -huh. lost, you know, and, and this was the time when I was transitioning from high school to college. So uh -huh. imagine you've just lost all your wealth from your family, you're about to enter La Salle, right? Uh -oh. Which is lots of glamour there. But one of the things I've learned early on that's carried through all my life is an example of my parents. Uh, they never give up. They okay. continue to invest in our education, yes. right? even with that you know, situation in our hand. And looking at my mom and my dad and seeing how they built this great business that they've lost you know, for some Yes. Re one reason or the other and not giving up and showing their kids that despite of all of that I'm gonna invest so that you could become us and let's keep trying this okay was really the foundation right, for my entrepreneurial uh, energy yes the learnings I have at La Salle and the mentorship I got of Intel those are just tools okay but the yes. definition early in life was the most important yeah, but part. I, I need to give them because it's so surprising for me when you built the company glue code mm -hmm. that was your first company what did it do so glue code quickly so software is very expensive yes and software what, is how old were you then when you built your well, first i started thing? at 30 so i, I 30. had very pro program okay. life right i wanted to be i wanted to leave intel uh when i was uh you know before 30 i want to okay. build and sell my first company at 30 which i did and uh, i got some more ambitions going forward yeah. from there but i was only i was 30 when i built glue code uh, what, we what? sold it in 2005 yeah. to IBM. To I how, much, how much did you sell Glucode? So the only thing we are allowed to say is that the first five engineers at Glucode, the first, you know, these are the engineering yeah. team, not Mark the executive. Pinoy, Renu, engineering some team. are Pinoy, some are uh, people from the open source uh, world. They made five, $2 million each, the first five what? engineers, right? And that's my goal is to build as many. So how much did you make? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. The IRS might go after me. My you. I'm God, you think, are you serious? <laughs> It's, uh, it's enough for me to build other companies, and we built four companies. You did this when you were 30? I, I was fortunate enough to be able to get No, I mean, you don't have to tell me, but if, can I take a, a guess? So did you sell it to IBM for $50 million? It's the, the official Just press give me release. Just the official says press release. Yeah, it's under $100 million. What? Yeah. Your first company you built when you were 30, you sold for under... Hundred million dollars? Yeah, it goes zero to a hundred million, right? <laughs> oh <laughs> but no, it God. was a, it was a very good outcome. Uh, it took us about eleven months from from the first time we took venture capital money. Uh, but in fact, Karen, I, I felt like I sold early. I, I'm actually thinking back. I should have kept it a little bit longer. But how how do we do, uh, how do we copy your brain? <laughs> no, we, I mean, how do we you? don't have to copy my brain. I think what, what's important here in the Philippines is to build what we call infrastructure for innovation and, and, and yeah. entrepreneurship. No, no but when you, when, when you meet people like IBM, they want to buy your company in Silicon Valley, do they say, who are you? I mean, 
Well, or, was, do, or they look down, or do they think you're Chinese, or do they say you're Does it matter? Did you, did you experience well, discrimination? It did matter, okay. um, and it was uh, something that we're working on. Are you uh, serious? There is such thing as a Filipino discount in Silicon Valley right now, and simply because we have not made our mark there, and we have to make our mark in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, the, the most important fact here is to have passion and never give up. I learned that very early. Second is to have great, great mentorship. I got that at Intel. You know, 10 years after leaving Intel, when I talk about Intel, it's still we. Yeah. Right, and and I build my company in that culture of Intel. That's the second part. Yes. The third thing, which I really wanted to have a call to action to the entrepreneurs in the Philippines, is that we need the largest corporations in the Philippines to be entrepreneurs themselves. That's exactly. what Silicon Valley is. Yeah. So we always talk about the entrepreneurs. We always talk about the lack of venture capital. I think because of oh. where we are. It's the conglomerates, it's the multinationals, it's the rich families. They need to take an innovation mindset. Yeah. They need to invest and reinvent themselves. Because hey, we can not be on mining forever or real estate forever, right? Yeah. The world's moving forward. And the next generation of the largest families of the country needs to, need to think entrepreneurship How, yeah. yes. outside of the context of their current yes, framework. Because yes. there's so much inertia uh, in that. Meaning outside the context of what their families have built I mean, moving forward to something else and they have the most ability to impact entrepreneurship in the country they yeah. have resources uh -oh. they have distribution they have contact they have wealth yeah right if they themselves lead the entrepreneurship revolution of the philippines then it will serve our entrepreneurs well okay now when you sold your first company you were 30 did you think of quitting no i was addicting really yeah first then the money was good obviously yeah. but the one thing about Blue Code was it basically... But were was you shocked that you made that much money? No. I was in venture capital. I invested, you know, yeah. several hundred million dollars for Intel. So it's, it's, I'm on that business already. I've been buying and selling companies yes. for Intel. No? The key but difference was you. that I was getting greedy. I was like, I want to be that. No, I'm not <laughs> selling for Intel. Yeah. Uh, for me, the first company was about validation that a Filipino can do it. Yes. The second, the third in the companies I'm in right now, it's a framework so that Filipinos can be great. Yes. And I'm hoping to be a part okay. of it. Okay. Now you have Morph Lab. Morph uh -huh. Labs. Uh -huh. Morph's Lab? Morph, Morph Labs. Morph Labs. Okay. Now Morph Labs tell me it's there's you have a do you have an office in Cebu? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and you're starting an office in New York, etc. Can you can you tell us in layman's term what does Morph Labs produce? So Morph Labs is a software company yeah, at heart. You have heart. to talk to people that aren't techies, huh? <coughs> software uh -huh. company at heart. I'm proud to say it's engineered in Cebu. Okay. Engineered in Cebu? Yeah, it's still engineered in Cebu until now. A significant portion of our code no, uh -uh. comes from uh -uh. Cebu. Okay. And uh, it's designed all over the world. No? So our quality assurance is managed in Japan. Our yeah. user interface and architecture yes. is done in the, yes. in the uh, Silicon Valley and yes, California. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and then we have distribution capabilities around the world. Okay. 